Hi, everybody. This is uh, Silvio Canto in Dallas, Texas, on Tuesday, April 11th. And today we're going to be looking at some of the issues on the front pages. There's a couple of big stories, as well as a couple of things that everybody in the country is talking about, especially that incident uh, with that passenger who was on United Airlines, that incident that I'm sure all of us have seen the video. I've got a couple of thoughts about that. I want to talk about this article that I posted over Amer- about a, an American thinker where you see this very interesting political crisis in California, in the Golden State, where you have this battle between the interior and the coast. It's a very interesting political battle. I think it's going to have some some long-term consequences there in the state of California. And I also want to talk a little bit about this immigration march here in Dallas on Sunday that didn't turn out to be much of a march, uh, to say the least. It was really, really quite a bust to be honest with you. They were expecting a lot of people, but didn't really get uh, what they thought they were going to get. I do have some news about our show, which I'd like to share with you. Starting this week, we are going to be featured on YouTube. Uh, There's going to be, our show will be featured in a YouTube channel. It's called Canto Talk, and you can just go there and subscribe. One of the beauties of of the YouTube option is that we're going to be able to break the audio into parts. So if we do, let's say, uh, a 45-minute interview with somebody, instead of having to post the entire 45 minutes, we'll be able to break it up into a couple of parts, which I think will make it easier for the audience to listen to one part and then maybe come back later and listen to the, to the other part. So I think it's a great thing. It's a great development that uh, we've added this feature to the show. I'll have a lot more details on this. And I'm even thinking that we can have uh, the gentleman who's helping me with this project Hopefully we can have them on the show one of these days and maybe get a more of a technical explanation of what we're doing. But we're going to be on YouTube. The audio is going to be on YouTube. And I think uh, that will open up some markets uh, that we have not had up to now. Very quickly on this day in history, a couple of very important things. In 1951, one of the most interesting confrontations between a president and a military man happened on this day between President Truman and General MacArthur. At the time, President Truman was not very popular. General MacArthur was extremely popular. And we were fighting at the time the war in Korea, which was not a popular war as well. So in a sense, the popular feelings were with MacArthur, who had publicly said something that contradicted the president. So the president dismissed him. It was not, it was not a popular thing to do, But it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. If you live in a democracy where you have a civilian president, you cannot have, you cannot have your leading military person or your more most favorite or popular military person, in this case, General MacArthur, you cannot have that person publicly criticize the president of the United States. If you do that, you have to do your criticism with a resignation. And President Truman by dismissing General MacArthur, did exactly the right thing. He clearly demonstrated that he was the commander-in-chief, and if MacArthur wants to be commander-in-chief, he can run for the job. But he was the commander-in-chief. And again, it was not popular, but it was the right thing to do. And by the way, speaking of this moment between Truman and MacArthur, there is a great, an absolutely great biography of uh, President Harry Truman by David McCullough. It was written in the mid-90s, and I really think it brought back to many people who were not familiar with the Truman presidency, it really brought back the entire Truman presidency, one of the most consequential presidencies of the 20th century, because as you may remember, President Truman became president uh, uh, a month after, or not a month, but I mean on the day that President Roosevelt passed away, and President Roosevelt passed away a month after being inaugurated for the fourth time on April 12, 1945. In fact, this week will be another anniversary of that. So he was not a popular guy. He was not well known in the country. And, you know, he was replacing one of the political giants of the 20th century in the name of FDR. Well, it was tough. It was tough for President Truman to sort of grab the the attention of the country and then he was reelected in 1948. It was not an easy reelection. It was a very tough reelection. Most of the experts actually thought 
that Truman would be defeated. So his was a very controversial presidency, a very difficult presidency, particularly the second term. But I think history will note that on this particular issue, President Truman was correct in dismissing uh, MacArthur. So that happened on this day in 1951. In 1970, on April 11th, 1970, we had Apollo 13 took off for the moon. Nobody had a clue, of course, of what would happen a couple of days later. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about, the oxygen tank exploding and all the difficulties they had getting the three men back to Earth. So it took off today. Much of the country probably was not watching it because these takeoffs had become pretty casual and pretty boring. But if Apollo 13 did anything, is that it really brought everybody back to Earth in the sense that we understood just how dangerous these missions were, that we were basically putting three people in one of those capsules and going around the moon. Well, that's a dangerous activity. And uh, so the, the three men of Apollo 13, uh, great, great heroes, great astronauts. And, of course, if you watch the movie Apollo 13, I think you'll get a Hollywood version, which is pretty close to reality, of what, uh, of what happened. I mentioned that uh, we have a post over at the American Thinker where I talk about this crisis happening in California, where you have a political division happening. You basically have uh, California is becoming politically two states. You have the coast, and if you look at the map, that's where all the big cities are, of course. And you have the interior, which is primarily small towns and a lot of agricultural areas, lesser population. So obviously when the vote, and the vote comes in, particularly for president, the coast will prevail, and that's why you see Hillary Clinton winning the presidency in California by 4 million votes. But the problem is that the interior is also very productive uh, and very important to the, the industry and, and of the state of, of California. And there's obviously a disconnect there. And many people in the interior are feeling like they're completely disconnected. In fact, there's a quote uh, of a gentleman in the interior who says, we don't have a seat at the table, meaning that decisions are being made and the interest of the interior are not being uh, taken, uh, taken into account. I think this is a unsustainable situation out there. And I think at some point those people in the interior are going to break away and maybe move or try to move to another state. They're already doing that. But I mean literally try to break away and have their own identity, their own state. This is something that is growing in California. California, particularly because of the coast in San Francisco and L.A., is really, really looking very different in so many ways from the interior of the state. So keep an eye on this. This article is in the American Thinker. Keep an eye on this issue of what I call the rebellion of the interior, because I think it could be happening. It could be happening in California, where you see more and more people in the interior of California either move to Arizona, to Nevada, or to Texas, as we've seen, or simply look for some kind of separation from the rest of California and maybe even forming their own state, whatever it may be. It, it's one of those situations that you got to keep an eye on because it's going to get, uh, it's, it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. I mentioned that there was a march on Sunday here, the so-called mega immigration march. And I have a post about this coming out on, on Wednesday morning. It turned out to be a real bust. It was not a, it was not a mega march. It turned out to be a real bust. What happened was that, you know, and, and for those of you who live in Dallas, you may remember that back in 2006, 2007, we had huge marches back then. We had 100,000 people, 300,000 people. Some even estimated half a million people. But the marches were huge. You could see it from, from any uh, helicopter view. I mean, it was a huge march. Well, this time, according to the police, there were only 3,200 people uh, listening to the speakers. Now, there may have been a few more who went to the march, but the ones who were actually listening to the speakers and participating, the police estimated that there were 3,200. Well, that's a bust. I mean, that's a horrible performance by, by, any, by any account. Now, there's some dispute as to what happened. I think what may have happened is that the march did not really have a focus. It wasn't really about immigration. It was about a lot of issues, refugee issues, health care, jobs, and so on. So it wasn't specifically about immigration as some of the past marches had been. That's one theory as to what happened. My theory is a little bit different. I actually think that what's happening is 
there's great disenchantment in the Hispanic community with Hispanic leaders, most of them being Democrats. I think there's great disenchantment. And I talk a little bit about this in my piece at the American Thinker. So if you have a chance uh, on Wednesday, uh, check the, my, my post, because I think there's a real crisis of leadership. There, there is a real crisis of credibility for many of these uh, Hispanic leaders. They've been over-promising and not delivering. And I think that's what their problem, their problem really is. We learned uh, this week, of course, that Dr. Susan Rice and the Obama administration may not have been uh, upfront about what was happening in Syria with the weapons of mass destruction. We're finding out right now that they told us that everything was fine, but we're finding out that it isn't really fine. I have no idea what's going to happen with Syria, with North Korea, with China, but I think something has to give in Syria. And I support the president for what he did. I think it was the right thing to do, given the fact that uh, Assad was using chemical weapons. I don't necessarily support the idea of sending in troops unilaterally. Now, if we have some kind of an international coalition, that's different. But putting American troops into Libya, I think, would be very difficult, given that uh, that's a crazy civil war. I mean, it's really gone crazy over the last few years, and I wouldn't even know who to support. But I do expect the president to be uh, very firm again if Assad uses chemical weapons, and I think he's exactly right about that. We have got to deliver the message that it's one thing to fight among people, but it's quite another story when you introduce uh, chemical weapons. One last uh, issue today. Everybody in the country is talking about this incident with United Airlines and the passenger. I guess I have to tell you up front that I'm not enough of a flyer to know what goes on in these uh, in these flights. I just don't fly enough. And to be honest with you, when I have a choice, I'd rather drive. I'd rather take a bus. I'd rather get anywhere without flying. I'm just not a big fan of going into airports and you got to go through all of this security. And I understand why they do it. I'm not knocking the people who are doing it. I just don't like to go through it. So anyway, I'm not a big flyer. But uh, it appears to me that in this case, what really puzzles me about uh, the, this incident at United Airlines, and for those who may not know, I'm talking about the incident where they were dragging the, pes- the passenger out of the plane. What I really have a hard time believing is that here you have 100 people in a flight. The flight was going from Chicago to Louisville, Kentucky. It's not like the flight is going from Chicago to L.A. or Chicago to London. I mean, you're going to Louisville, Kentucky. It's probably an hour flight. And that there wasn't a single person in that flight who stood up and said, look, I'll give up my seat. I don't, you know, I don't have to get to Louisville, Kentucky in an hour. I'll, I'll take the next flight, maybe stay overnight if I have to. That there wasn't one person in that flight who said, I volunteer to stay. That's the part that amazes me. That's the part that puzzles me. And it makes me wonder if the, if the airline communicated everything correctly to the people in that flight. Because I guarantee you, if they offer me 400 bucks or whatever, or some free tickets, I would have done it. I would have said, hey, put me down. I'll stay, in, uh, I'll stay at O'Hare Airport or whatever for another, for another bit of time while you are uh, – why you are, uh, you know, letting this other person fly to, uh, to wherever you're going. So that's the part that puzzles me. I don't quite get that, but I don't fly enough. Maybe that's why I understand it. Have a wonderful day, everybody. This is uh, Silvio Canto in Dallas.